Welcome to another Achieve CE live webinar. This course is approved by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, otherwise known as ACPE. Once you complete this webinar, your course credits will be reported to the CPE monitor and CE broker within 24 to 48 hours, and you will be emailed a certificate. The last few minutes of this webinar will be dedicated to a live question and answer session with the instructor. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat below during the presentation, and they will be responded to by the instructor at the end. At the end of this webinar, a link to a short online survey will be provided in the chat. Please note that you must complete this survey in order to receive course credit. In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. Hi everyone, welcome in. My name is Dr. Tim Brown. We're gonna discuss Pharmacotherapy 2022 new drugs for primary care. Specifically, these drugs were approved in 2021 and entering the market in 2022 and possibly being delayed a bit depending on the cost and uptake by insurance companies. So let's get started. As I mentioned, my name is Tim Brown. I'm the Director of Interprofessional Education for the University of Georgia's College of Pharmacy and a Professor in Pharmacology and Toxicology at Augusta University and the Medical College of Georgia and UGA Partnership. I used to work in primary care for 26 years with a group of family medicine physicians at the Cleveland Clinic Akron General. Because of this, it really spurred me to sort of keep up to date with what was coming out so I could be prepared in case I had questions from physicians with regarding to new medications. I've been doing this particular type of lecture for about 16 to 17 years now, and every year this pushes me to stay current and to stay ahead of the curve, if you will, when it comes to education with students and residents. I will tell you that I do not have any aspect of commercial support in this. This is uh, me putting together a list of medications that have come out for primary care over the past year uh, and have no financial obligation to anyone with regard to disclosure. Here are your learning objectives. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about the new agents. We're going to outline where they may fit and the guidelines when they make it there, and also the benefits, risk, as well as the cost of where these products sit in relation to what's already on the market, if they have any competition at all. So one of the aspects that I cover very quickly is to put things in perspective for you. In 2021, the FDA did approve 50 new drugs and biologics versus 53 in 2022. On average, 43 of these were novel drugs over the last 10 years. When you look at this particular category, 27 of the 50 were first in class. What does that mean? Well, stop and think about the first proton pump inhibitor, the first ACE inhibitor the first statin. Those revolutionized the way we manage certain illnesses and disease states. You can imagine a new in-class product can be groundbreaking. It can also be the foundation to build upon. Think about the TZDs when we first had uh, Regulin on board and those didn't, it did not work as well as what came afterwards. So you can imagine that in some of these groups that we're going to talk about, we're going to have some drugs here that do change the way we look at managing certain disease states. Also, it may broaden the way we think about management of certain disease states as well as we have more and more information. 26 of these 50 do treat rare orphan diseases. And I will tell you that there's a lot of discussion about how much drugs cost, how much medications cost to the public. It's astronomical. We do know that in a JAMA article in 2018 that it was projected that the majority of products take about $2.6 billion in about 10 years to bring to the market. However, what we're finding is bringing it to the market has decreased in time over the years, and now we're seeing much more of the post-marketing surveillance playing a significant role in finding side effects and problems that we weren't aware of. Also, some hidden gems such as this drug causes weight loss, which wasn't expected because it was being tr looked at for diabetes, for example. So the post-marketing surveillance for pharmacists and other providers is important because it gives us feedback about what these drugs are going to do overall. And also 
it sort of fills in that gap of getting the drugs on the market even quicker. They have gone through the FDA process, but that post-market surveillance tends to be uh, even more important than ever. I will tell you that looking at the cost and the pricing of note in January of 2022, companies increased the price of 785 branded products by 4.9 percent and 19 generics by almost 13 percent. So we are seeing an increase in product. Uh, I don't know how to just justify the generic product of 13 percent increase, but as pharmacists, we are seeing this. I also want to point out the reference I used here. This is the reference universally for each of these slides and each of these products. I will be fair, however, to say that I branched off of what the FDA.gov said and went looking for the articles themselves. There's not enough room to put every reference at the bottom of a slide, so I started with the universal one, and you can work from there if you're looking for the same information to help me create this presentation. So as I looked at how to do this in an organized fashion, I realized that instead of throwing a bunch of random drugs together, I would group them by broad category. So in between each changeover, I will have a broad category slide moving us through this process so at least we can sort of keep track of where we are as we go through this. Now, please keep in mind that I don't talk about every product that was approved in 2021. I'm talking about those products that I think are geared much more towards the primary care arena. So a lot of these drugs are out or are administered in an outpatient office. So as we go through these, there might be products you know about that were approved in 2021, but if they did not have a primary care bent to them, I really try to stay within this category to, to sort of keep within the realm of an hour of CE. The first drug is Cabanuva. If you've not heard about this, this is actually groundbreaking when it comes to the way we look at managing HIV. This is a combination of two types of HIV management products or classes, and the indications have now gone uh, to the 12-year-old and up. It used to be adults only. It recently received the 12-year-olds and up, as long as that 12-year-old uh, and up weighs greater than 35 kilos. This is for people with HIV that have stable viral loads, less than 50 copies, and no history of treatment failure or resistance. And you're saying, well, okay, so what's what makes this drug different than the other drugs we use to manage HIV? Well, quite frankly, what really makes it different is it's injectable and it, the injections are actually separated out by months versus days. So adherence, compliance, it changes a bit and gives a bit more freedom with regard to pill load that many patients may have that are living with HIV. There, this drug was initially indicated with an oral lead-in therapy, which I have listed for you. They have found through the trials, the FLAIR trial, that that optional oral lead-in therapy probably isn't needed. You can go ahead and start out with the injections immediately. You can see these are separate IM injections. They are given in the office. Uh, one of the things that I would tell you is that these are usually injected monthly, although some of the newer stuff is coming up showing that can be injected every two months. Now, for those living with HIV, imagine that coming in every 60 days for your drug versus having to take a pill or multiple pills every day. It's a bit more freedom in terms of lifestyle, quality of life, those kinds of aspects. Also, this is done in the office, so it re really helps the person know about adherence that's taking care of them. So many times we see viral loads increase, and it's because someone has forgotten to take their medications, they could not get access to their medications, or we had folks that just didn't understand the importance of why you should take a medication daily. This particular aspect allows the, only the person to have quality of life, but the provider to know that they're receiving their medication routinely, keeping that viral load below 50 copies. It works just as well as any other traditional three-drug therapy as Bictarvia, uh, as, as we talk about, which is the big commercial you see on TV. Common side effects are listed there for you, fever, fatigue, headache, all those things you would expect. There is the aspect of a rare skin reaction called dress. You need to be aware of that, and people need to know what to look for when it comes about. Uh, increased monitoring. There are a lot of drug interactions here, as, as there are with many of the HIV medications. So as pharmacists, we need to make sure we run this through our drug uh, interaction checker to, make, to look and make sure it doesn't interact with either chronic maintenance products. Cost, maintenance dose is about 4000 a month, which is insanely expensive. However, even the oral therapies are running between, th between three and $3,500 a month. So it is in the category. There is the aspect, of course, of the convenience of every other month dosing versus daily dosing. Going to our first question. How often should a patient on PrEP be screened for HIV? Every month, every three months, every six months, or they do not require screening at all ongoing. So I'll give you a couple minutes to think your way through that. This is dealing with PrEP for HIV, not management of HIV, but PrEP 
people on medication to prevent the transmission of HIV. All right. Very good. Let's see what everybody says. You're absolutely correct. Every three months, the CDC says that for those taking this particular medication, we need to make sure that we are looking at their HIV status every three months to make sure that they have not contracted HIV. The reason for that is this product that they're using can set up resistance to traditional medications if they do become positive. It's also a good idea every three to six months that there should be an STI screen in general, depending on the activity of the patient. So you could also put in gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and even looking for hepatitis and HSV. Again, that does not have to happen every three months. Some practitioners do it every year. Others do it every six months. And then some do do this at every three months, depending on the patient and their risk. So I did this particular question to lead into this drug, Apertude. This is actually a piece of the uh, the carbonuva we were talking about earlier. This is a new way to do PrEP to stop transmission of HIV. Of course, we know about Truvada and Descovy. This is the first one out there that's actually injectable. It reduces the risk of acquiring HIV. Again, 12 years of age and up, greater than 35 kilos. Optional use oral lead-in, just like we saw with Cabanuva. In this particular situation, it's 600 milligrams of one drug for the first two months. Then you actually do it every two months. You can start out with the 600 milligrams every month for those two months without the oral lead-in. Again, studies are showing that this is optional. So keep in mind, instead of taking a pill every day to stop the transmission of HIV, this product, again, is every two months. Also being monitored by a healthcare professional because this is being given in a healthcare setting. So once again, adherence, compliance can be assessed, and you're looking at the fact that you can keep people on track with regard to reduction of HIV. And you're saying to yourself, well, is this good? Is this bad? If you stop and think about this, this is actually very convenient. Compliance increases. And then if you have someone that has issues with remembering their medications because of other concomitant illnesses or difficulty in general of being compliant or their risk is extremely high of acquiring HIV based on the nature of their work or social life, this really does add another layer into the PrEP discussion. They did show in the clinical trials that when you looked at this with uninfected men and transgender women, the results showed superiority even over Truvada, 69% reduction in the risk of acquiring HIV. I will tell you that when you look at some of the data for Truvada, it ranges from 69 to 88%. Truvada has some data that says 80 to 99%. Right now, we know that using these products reduce transmission a great deal. The statistics are all over the place. I've heard about 80% on average from the clinical trials and the reduction of transmission in dealing with those that are uh, men having sex with men and transgender women. Please keep in mind that when we look at this, they are comparing it to the gold standard, which is Truvada that's been on the market the longest. Descovy was not in this particular clinical trial. Also, we tend to associate HIV transmission with men having sex with men or a gay lifestyle. We forget sometimes that this HIV can happen to anyone at any time. So this trial also included uninfected cisgender women and showed superiority over Truvada as well with an 88% reduction in this particular population. If you look at statistics across the nation, you will find that HIV prevalence continues to be um, – similar for certain groups, increased for others, depending on where you live. So, for example, I live in Georgia. We are seeing a huge increase in the number of black women being infected with HIV. So looking at someone's habits, what's going on, risk, if they're simply having sex, should they be a candidate for um, a PrEP product if they're not in a monog monogamous relationship? That is a conversation between a primary care provider and their patient. But I will tell you, in my area, we're looking at folks that um, are women identifies black, and we're seeing an increase in HIV transmission. That's also true in black men. So when you're looking at who should receive PrEP, only about 25% of those that are actually, excuse this term, eligible by FDA discussion um, are getting it. Only one-fourth are getting PrEP. So this drug adds another layer, as I mentioned, because now we can talk about compliance, adherence, ease of use, because it's not a pill every day, and also access to care. For everyone, 
that would qualify for PrEP based on their um, risk factors and what is going on with regard to their sex lives. I did put here for safety, you can look at the common side effects. You do have to watch out here for depression and suicidal ideation. And again, there are many drug interactions. This is $3,700 a dose. If you guys will remember correctly, when Trivada first came on the market, it was about $1,000 to $1,200 for a 30-day supply of pills. So this is over two months. So split this in half, and you're looking at approximately $1,700 to $1,800. Uh, so it is higher. However, with inflation, it does track with what Travada would have been today if it were approved versus the 10 years ago. This particular product I find interesting. It's Brexafem. Brexafem was the first drug approved in the new antifungal class, which is not an azole. So in other words, it's not dealing with fluconazole, ketoconazole. This is completely different. It's indicated for VVC or vaginal yeast infections. It's 150 milligrams times two twice a day for one day. Total of 600 milligrams. So basically 300 milligrams in the morning, 300 milligrams in the evening. Boom. Done. One day dosing out the door. I mean, people are like, well, gosh, that's great because we know that we use fluconazole times one right now. The question is, is this better than fluconazole? In the clinical trials, it was not inferior. So they were basically the same. And the candle trial is pending to show how this works for recurrent infections as well as uh, resistant ones to azole. So right now, if you're treating someone first line therapy, this is not where you would go. Uh, if you have someone though, that has multiple fungal infections or they have a resistant strain to fluconazole, for example, there's a possibility this drug may be superior overall. Safety. Diarrhea, nausea, GI side effect. Uh, there is a contraindication of pregnancy, so you need to make sure this person is on birth control and they do have a, um, a backup method that does cause birth defects if used in those that are pregnant. You need to verify they are not pregnant prior to using this. Uh, the interactions with 3A4s, you reduce this to, uh, in half, and because of this, you would actually only use that 150 milligrams times two tablets in the morning. It is $500 versus 15 for fluconazole. So as I mentioned earlier, this drug would stay first line there, I'm sorry, say second, third line therapy, while fluconazole would remain first line therapy, unless, of course, the candle trial shows thus the resistance patterns, and this is superior in that situation. Oh, and by the way, just so you know, uh, Deflucan only has about a 55% cure rate overall. Now, the company says 80 to 90%, but in the clinical trial, it's 55. So you may see this drug move up a little bit over the next two to five years as we see more and more resistance to uh, fluconazole and the azoles. Paxlovid, we're all familiar with this. This is the protease inhibitor that we use to boost the concentration in the body overall when it comes to um, the antiviral when it comes to COVID. Mild to moderate COVID infection, those greater than 12 years of age, greater than 40 kilos. You use this when people come down with COVID to keep them out of the hospital. The dosing is listed there for you. We've been using this for quite some time right now. We know that overall uh, efficaciously, this prevents hospitalizations in one in 18 high risk patients or a reduction of about 89% in people getting um admitted to the hospital. It appears similar to the IV drugs we've been using. However, this is an oral product overall. Safety is listed there for you. Be cautious for those that uh, have hypertension. You cannot use this in pregnancy. Right now, due to the pandemic, the current price is about $7 for a, a quick course of this. However, the model has shifted recently, and I did some research on this. Per pharmacy today, uh, Trial or a course of Paxlovid, if you have to have it, if you come down with COVID, is about $500. That is without the government assistance that we've been seeing for COVID coverage for medications. So this drug now being out there, the drug interactions, be cautious there on blood thinners and statins. There is an interaction that is out there, and we want to make sure that we do tell people about it if they get Paxlovid. However, with COVID and someone that could be admitted to the hospital and have an um, adverse outcome, such as death, this may overrule uh, the drug interaction, and we would simply hold their statin, for example, while they're on this product. This was Merck's side of the Paxlovid, if you will, and it really didn't take off. I included it so you would have it. You can see down below it prevents hospitalization in 1 in 35 or about 30%. So nowhere near as high as the 89% saw with Paxlovid. So because of that, this drug really did not get a lot of traction. Contricating pregnancy listed there for you. Side effects appeared minimal with this. With Paxlovid, about 20% of the folks who are on Paxlovid will have some sort of side effect, including that nasty taste in their mouth that everybody talks about. 
This product, not so much. Very much lower in side effects compared to the others, according to that, although not as many people were exposed to this drug, this drug as they were to Paxlovid. Taking this off the um, government assistance payment for COVID medications, the payment here for this particular course of drug is going to run you about $700 versus $500 with Paxlovid. Both of those numbers are um, accredited to Pharmacy Today, who gave me, who gave me that in an article. Ticovac. I found this really incredible. Ticovac is an activated whole virus vaccine to prevent tick-borne infections. Actually, in particular, to prevent encephalitis in patients one year of age or greater. The doses are listed there for you. You can see it's a multi-dose, and it's a booster is given every three years. What they did was they showed in real-world data, if you used all three doses, it reduced TBE by 96 to about 99% in terms of all three doses being given. So this is given to those that are endemic areas where we see ticks causing the encephalitis. It's about $1,000 for the course overall. Intervals are based on the patient ages I've talked about. And what I didn't realize is about up to 2% of people who come down with this die from TBE. So this is really for those areas that were endemic I've talked about or if you're traveling to an area. I don't see this being used a great deal throughout the United States at this point in time, but I thought it was interesting to, and I wanted to bring it up so you realize this could be something that someone receives if, for example, they're going on mission trips, um, ministering to other countries, or actually going to travel in various countries as well where this would be endemic. New Zyra. This is a new tetracycline. This expands the category or the coverage a bit for traditional tetracyclines and the fact that gram-positive, gram-negative, and atypicals are caught by this particular product. New Zyra is broadening out to cover for, you know, the strep, the staph, as well as the E. coli, Klebsiella, and of course the six atyp I'm sorry, the uh, six a the three atypicals that we have available, Mycoplasma, Legionella, and Chlamydia. Broadened to treat community acquired pneumonia. CAPS indication is 300 milligrams twice a day for one day and then 300 milligrams daily for four days minimum. So this drug has moved into the CAP category. It is not in the guidelines. At this point in time, outpatient treatment for CAP is amoxicillin, but this drug has moved up a bit. Now, we've always used Doxy as an add-on in many situations to get the atypicals. You have seen Doxy used to manage CAP by itself as monotherapy. This drug is moving into this uh, category as well and trying to take over that. In the OPTIC trial, it was non-inferior to moxifloxacin with treatment rates around 93 to 90% for both. Because of that, you cannot say this drug is better than a quinolone. However, we know there are issues with quinolones being used first-line therapy now. Side effects are listed there. Please note that there was a 2% mortality rate in the OPTIC trial with this drug, and no one really has any idea why, versus 1% with moxifloxacin. The Cap the 250 ml capsule for a dose for four days is two thousand dollars, guys. Although doxycycline has gone up a great deal, I think in what people are paying for it. I think uh, I saw a couple of things recently where doxy could be anywhere between 100 and 150 dollars, depending on which version you're using, what your insurance does, those things. But certainly, it remains cheaper than two thousand dollars for a course here. Also, amoxicillin plus doxy would be cheaper as well. It's just the pill burden's a bit different compared to what you would take with this new particular tetracycline. Let's move categories. Let's move into urology, nephrology. One of the areas with this particular product, Zemtiza, is a beta-3 receptor agonist that causes the bladder to relax. It's similar to Mybetric. It's used for overactive bladder overall. Drugs in general in this category don't really have a huge amount of effect. Um, I would tell you they decrease in continence by, I don't know, one or two times a day. Uh, so they can have impact on quality of life. But overall, the non-farm, the bladder training is a much better um, choice in terms of managing overactive bladder. Although we do see a lot of people go to this. I will say that overall, this does not have as much of an anticholinergic effect as we see with Myrobetric. So you don't have that uh, dry mouth constipation, you know, those kinds of things. So it's a little easier overall. 75 milligrams once a day. Uh, statistically significant reductions in the urge urinary incontinence or the UUI, micturation, and urgency episodes over that 12-week period that this clinical trial existed. In general, this particular product had headaches and GI and, of course, some urinary retention. That's what it's here for. No impact, however, on blood pressure and heart rate where my metric did and no uh, no drug interactions when it comes to the P450 system. Do, uh, do, dosing is much easier with this one, and cost is almost identical to my metric. 
I will tell you, first line therapy right now for uh, overactive bladder or OAB are anti-muscarinic transdermals like ditri- or long-acting ones like Ditropan, which is about fifteen dollars a month. So a little bit more expensive uh, when looking at this product, a beta three receptor agonist, looking at the anti-muscarinic. But we also know that anti-muscarinic has the anticholinergic side effects. And we know that anticholinergic side effects could lead to some aspects of dementia if used long term for those greater than 40 years of age from the trial out of uh, Great Britain that we saw. I will tell you that this particular product does allow the smooth muscle to relax a bit more using the beta-3 receptor agonist and allows the bladder to store more urine by expanding a bit more. So there are benefits to both of these. Uh, However, you will see that. People are trying to get away from the anti-muscarinics because of those anticholinergic side effects and the association with possibly dementia later in life. Uh, There has been some data about saying, should we use an anti-muscarinic with a beta-3? When you put the two together, it really did not have that much more of an impact on the outcome and the reduction of um, incidents throughout the day of micturation or incontinence. Assessment question. Which class of medications used to manage diabetes also have been proven to have an impact on CKD progression? A. Recombinant DNA insulins. B. Iguanides. C. GLP-1 agonist. Or D. SGLT2 inhibitors. I'll give you a moment to think about that. Once again, we're looking for medications that manage diabetes, but they also have been proven to impact CKD progression. Think your way through that. The answer is SGLT2 inhibitors. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm actually doing a talk on diabetes Uh, several different groups coming up, and this is a huge aspect and discussion point with SGLT2s is their impact on CKD progression and slowing that down and increasing the GFR and stabilizing it. Well, there's another drug that does something similar to this. It is not an SGLT2, but I want to make you aware of this drug as well because I think SGLT2s are getting a great deal of press and discussion. But Corinda has really not had a lot of talk because it stands out as the first in its category. And when you look at this particular drug, it did reduce the sustain, it reduced the risk of sustained EGFR decline. It also reduced end-stage CKD, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and hospitalization for heart failure patients associated with CKD and type 2 diabetes. The dosing is there for you based on the GFR. What is the really miraculous thing is look at the efficacy. I tell you that it had those indications. This is what it does. But this is the trial that showed a primary endpoint decrease in instance of sustained decline in EGFR by greater than 40%. Also, kidney failure or renal death with 99.8% that actually prevented mortality in those that had CKD and issues with their kidneys, especially if they were already on an ACE or an ARB. Primary endpoints you see listed there for you with the percentages, but the secondary endpoint is just as important. This showed a reduction in cardiovascular death, a reduction in non-fatal MI, and a reduction in that hospitalization of heart failure patients. So this product has a lot going for it. SGLT2s had a lot going for it for CKD and hospital hospital administration. A couple of the SGLT2s do have some cardiovascular death reduction associated with them, but not the entire package like this product. So it'll be interesting to see, for example, if we use this with an SGLT2 and our people with type 2 diabetes, would the would the effects be synergistic? Will we see an even greater drop in mortality? It'll be interesting to see that over the years and see what goes on. But this is first in class to help with CKD. It is used in type 2 diabetic patients. And you can see it has an endpoint not only on kidneys, but on cardiovascular health as well. Be cautious. You can have hyperkalemia with this because it's very similar to a potassium sparing diuretic. But at the same point in time, it is not as great as what we would see with spironolactone, for example. Cost $680 a month. So it is expensive. But however, keeping someone off dialysis is that really that much to pay per month, knowing how much dialysis costs uh, per week with regard to life sustaining therapy. Endocrinology. 
I sort of grouped this together because I went from SGLT2s and I kind of want to stay in the line of diabetes patients. And the drug I want to bring up is Wegovy. We all know this. We know semaglutide. It's been around as Orencia for a long time. We know that they reapplied for um, a different indication under a different brand name and went with a higher dose overall for weight loss or weight loss management. This product has gotten a huge amount of press recently because of its efficacy. The discussion has been, you know, can I stay on this for the rest of my life to reduce my weight? Well, if you have diabetes, certainly. But what about those people who are using this that do not have diabetes? Is there an endpoint? What do you do? The weight loss was pretty significant. 5% to 10% weight loss in the majority of people who use this product. And you're saying to yourself, well, 5% doesn't sound like a lot. Well, if you caught the CE, the last one that I did on weight management or obesity, you would know that the average year loss is around 5 to 10%. If you exceed 10% in your weight loss for a year, you've done an exceptional job. So 5 to 10% is actually about right with regard to what the expectation would be to losing weight. However, in talking to people that have been on this product, they've exceeded this. There are people who've lost hundreds of pounds using an, a GLP-1. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. But then also, when do they stop? Because studies are showing that when they stop, they regain some of the weight. Overall, this product continues, continues to be used, particularly those that have type 2 diabetes at the lower doses under the trade name Orencia. Can you titrate up using Orencia? Yes, it's an off-labeled use. This particular product is dose adjusted for those for the indication of weight loss. Cost is about $1,600 a month. Orencia runs about $1,100 a month, maybe $900 at the cheapest. So you, there is a price discrepancy between the two semiglutides that are on the market that are sub-Q. There is an oral semiglutide. However, weight loss has not been associated with it at this point. It is difficult to take with regard to making sure the absorption occurs in the gut. So it does have a couple of rules about administration, and I'm not sure they're going to be able to increase the dose of the oral because of that quick breakdown and because it's so fragile with regard to the GI um, system and the acid in the gut. This is an insulin that is the second biosimilar insulin glargine on the market. Resgovlar is actually not interchangeable, however, with insulin glargine. It is a biosimilar, which means that it looks and smells just like its parent, but it doesn't necessarily have the ability to be interchanged like a generic drug would be, for example. Management of diabetes, this drug is not going to surprise you, it is similar to Lantus. It's that's sort of its parent, if you will, or its grandparent. Bascalar is out there as well. There are several of these on the market. You will notice above where I have the generic name, the three initials afterwards. That's how we're breaking these down so you know which of the generic names are associated with which of the branded products. So for Resgivilar, Resvilar, man, I just pronounced that so badly. A-G-L-R is going to be associated with it. The price for this one was pending, so I went to look to see how it compared overall, and I couldn't really find a lot of information. I did find that Lantus is about $450 for five pens. Bascalar is about $211, so we're thinking it's going to have to come out below $211 to be competitive overall. Once again, this is not any better than Lantus, not any worse, and as pharmacists, we cannot substitute this drug for Lantus to save money. We would need a prescription specifically with this branded product or that generic name with those four initials after it to dispense this Glargine. That's not true for Simgly. This is the first interchangeable Glargine biosimilar insulin to hit the market. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means exactly what I just talked about with the last product that you couldn't do, you can now do with this. The FDA relaxed the rules on how to do interchangeability when it comes to biosimilars. As we've known, if there's a generic product on the market, as pharmacists, we can substitute one for the other to save the patient money. In this particular situation, we've never really been able to do that with biosimilars. It had to be their very specific prescription about the one you had to have that was the lower cost. Here, with this Glargine, because in the clinical trials, it showed the same as Glantis when it came to safety, purity, and potency, but then it also showed the same clinical results. They went for that interchangeability kind of checkbox in their application to the FDA. It showed that it was same or similar to Glargine, Lantus. Because of that, you can now substitute or interchange this product to get to a lower cost if somebody had written, for example, Lantus. Side effects are all the same. Here's the, here's the big take home. When you look at the cost down below 
$120 for a vial, $200 for a box of five pens. It's $211 for Bascalar. $340 a vial or $450 for pens uh, for the Lantus. So you can see that it's $200 versus $400. I did go searching for this, and I will tell you that the prescriber's letter, the pharmacist's letter, says it's $150 for a box of five. So a little discrepancy from the $200 I found. But then when I went to Blink and a couple other independent apps, this was $425 for five pens. So I found the price to be all over the place. As pharmacists, we may have to look into this to see if the interchangeability is actually saving the person money. My gut instinct is it will. I'm just saying the references I looked at did not give me a solid, this is how much it's going to cost for a box of five pens. The Lantus, $450. I found that several places overall for a cash pay patient. You and I both know that a lot of people have insurance that changes. I'm just sort of doing a cash pay back and forth with regard to how we would see co-pays work, for example, if they were percentages. Tepeza has been all over the news. This drug has gotten so much discussion and a lot of um uh, airtime when it comes to TV. This is an insulin-like growth factor 1 receptor inhibitor that blocks basically the eyes bulging out during Graves' disease. So it stops that or reverses that so the eyes return back to a no sort of a normal shape. And I hate using the word normal, but you know it minimizes that that um, proptosis that we see with Graves. The dosing is listed there for you. It's seven doses altogether with everything. Two clinical trials did show that this did work. They just defined success by a reduction of two millimeters in the proptosis from baseline. So the eyes regressed by two millimeters. 71 and 83 percent met this criteria with 2.5 and 2.5. 2.8 negatively changed. In other words, 2.5 millimeters, 2.8 millimeters. Once this was discontinued, however, the effect lasted for about one year for about 50% of patients. So once this stopped, people were able to maintain that reduction in the bulging of the eye for about a year, half of those people. Not everybody, not everybody retained that reduction over the course of the year. You do have to be careful. This does exacerbate inflammatory bowel diseases. It can cause hyperglycemia. So if you have diabetes, a little bit of caution with that as well. The other thing to keep in mind is the cost. It's weight-based dosing. There's a 500 milligram dose that's $18,000. I took a 90 kilo person, sort of an average size person, and said, okay, what would this look like if this person were 90 kilos or about 180 pounds as a gentleman? This would be a maintenance therapy of about $60,000 per maintenance dose. Per maintenance dose, $60,000 per maintenance dose, which is seven doses. So this is a huge amount of money. The impact, of course, is cosmetic. The other thing about this is, of course, is a sense of well-being and reducing that proptosis, but it is not a, a long-lasting effect beyond a year for 50% of the patients. So... Blending once again from one category to the next because we talked about Tepeza and the endocrinology category when it came to Graves' disease and thyroid disorders, but also dealing with the eye, I moved into ophthalmology after this. We all know this particular product is Chantix, which is off the market because of a couple of things that were going on with uh, the ingredients. It has been rebranded and also um, <laughs> rebottled. I think we could talk, into a nasal spray with cholinergic effects. By doing this, it's actually caused to help with dry eye disease by increasing tear production overall. One spray each nostril every 12 hours. You, don't re you do not redose if the patient sneezes, which all of us are like, oh my gosh, I just sneezed and I just you know, blew that drug right back out where I put it. You do not. Also, the uh, instructions to use this particular nasal spray, you have to make sure that people understand it or they will waste product or not get product. So they have to prime the pump seven times, then tilt the head back, insert and point towards the top of the ear, tongue on the roof of the mouth and breathe in while they're doing this. Then you repeat that in the other nostril. It takes four weeks for this to have impact on dry eye. So read those instructions and understand that not everybody's going to follow those beautifully. But that's what has to happen for this drug to get to where it needs to go in the tear ducts to cause that tear production. There's limited evidence with uh, efficacy, and there's no other study I could find out there saying this works better than this. So it sort of stands on its own. But really importantly, I talked about administration, and I want them to get the drug and not waste the drug and all those things. That's because a one-month supply, which is two bottles, is $4,500 for dry eye disease. Now, many people would say to you, do you really need to do this? Most would respond that lubricating eye drops you can buy over the counter are just as good as this overall. You also know that in the onset, 
with this particular uh, aspect, it did have some impact overall, but you can't say that it was better than using the lubricating eye drops that we have over the counter or even some of the other products that are out there. They did give one warning when I looked this up, besides priming the pump seven times, is you should never shake this bottle. And when I said I was laughing a bit about the sneezing when I was reading this, 82% will sneeze after they dose. So they should not redose themselves, but 82% sneezed after they dosed. And so for me, intuitively, I want to shake a bottle. I, I don't think about priming seven times, and if I'm sneezing after I give myself a dose in my nose, I think I should redose myself. Those are some of the take-home messages that we should tell patients. Do not do those things. Do not shake. Make sure you do prime seven times, and if you do sneeze, you do not have to redose. Uh, again, it's all there for you. It runs about $4,500 a month. I saw one statistic, or I'm sorry, one reference that said 5000 a month, but 4500 is what I found in the majority of the literature. Beauty. It's interesting because I have moved into that decade where I use reading glasses on a routine basis. I'm forever taking off a pair of sunglasses to put on a pair of reading glasses, or I'm forever looking for a pair of glasses to see what anything says. This solution acts as a cholinergic receptor agonist, and what it does is it changes the elasticity of the eye to allow you to read without glasses. You instill one drop at each eye daily. On sets within 15 minutes. It does wear off around six hours from that. The trials only lasted about 30 days. This is what we call that age-related blurry vision that some of us have. Um, it improves that near and immediate way we read books or, you know, look at my slides or look at any of those kinds of things without needing glasses. I, I will tell you that if you look down below, the Gemini 1 and 2 trials, so 26 and 31% achieved that desired efficacy endpoint, and they did gain several lines on the eye chart. So it did get much, much better. Here's the other take home, though, is to give yourself this dose is not quite as easy as we'd like it to be. You have to remove your contact lenses, wait 10 minutes after the dose to reinsert, and make sure that you are where you need to be <laughs> within six hours unless you have your reading glasses with you. So this may not get you all the way through the day. It does wear off around six hours. However, it could get you through the majority of the day if you use this right when you go into your workspace. The thing that I giggled a, bit, a little bit on this one is that this is basically pilocarpine. It's just be re reformulated into a new pH kind of barrier. So it has something called a new vehicle called pH AST. It allows the drug to adjust the pH of the eye tear film so it reduces the stinging. That's why we can use Vuity in the eye because the pilocarpine has been reformulated with this new kind of vehicle that allows that to occur. Of course, with that technology and with the clinical trials, it does come at a price. It costs $900 a month for you to read six hours a day, keeping this product in your eye and making sure you use the, the follow the rules in terms of insertion and how to do that with regard to your contact lenses. Uh, keep in mind, this could be wonderful for people who don't want to wear glasses all the time. However, $900 a month does make this prohibitive for many, many people. I put neurology here because the last one kind of made me feel old and made me think about my brain power, to be honest with you. Uh, that the fact that I have to be put a pile of carping drop in my eye to work six hours and to read versus if I'm trying to find my readers, which one do I prefer? Uh, that started me thinking about the aging process. So I put neurology in here and moved it into this product, which has come on the market with huge amounts of controversy. This is Aduhelm. This is a human IgG1 monoclonal antibody. It targets the amyloid beta protein in the brain, and it is indicated for the management of Alzheimer's disease. As many of you know, this has been controversial. Controversial for the FDA. They just didn't think it did what it should do to make it on the market. It does have a significant side effect called aria. Uh, it can also have cerebral edema, microhemorrhaging. Um, there's a lot that goes on with this product, and the question is, is it worth it for what you get from it? Clinical trials actually showed that there was a thinking skills decline of 22% more slowly when they were in, on this product. In other words, my thinking skills declined more slowly, that's the pro right, correct term, slower than they would have if I had not been on the product. However, when you look at an 18-point scale to sort of look at my thinking skills, and that these are the objective measure, that was only a 0.39 difference on an 18 point scale so is that really that big of an impact and also there's no clinical correlation to sort of move that in to say this is going to gain you six more months of independent thinking before alzheimer's comes in it's going to gain you a year for example of quality of living they weren't able to translate this into a clinical background 
I will tell you that in the trials, both trials were terminated early due to lack of cl clinical benefit. So it didn't make it on the market initially. So the company regrouped and did a subsequent trial that did show improvement overall. Now the question is, why didn't the first two trials show the benefit if the third trial did? The manufacturers say that the first two trials probably did not use a high enough dose per Biogen, who's the maker of the product. So they increased the dose in the one trial that did show reduction in mental decline. I will say that ARIA, the one that we talked here, which is the Amyloid Related Imaging Abnormalities, the Amyloid Related Imaging Abnormalities, um, with it came to hemorrhaging and those kinds of things was about 15%, and when it came to microhemorrhaging, 19%. So it does have an impact that could be detrimental with regard to bleeds. This is a product that continues to be on the market. It's a discussion of should it be used in people with Alzheimer's disease, and certainly where should it be used with people with Alzheimer's disease. Is this in mild disease? which I think is where a lot of people think about putting it to slow that progression that's out there in mild dementia. I don't think we can really talk about this in regard to moderate to severe Alzheimer's. So please keep in mind that you would have to know someone has Alzheimer's very early on to use this. And that's difficult to do to catch people in that mild stage because they're not being screened as readily and we're not finding people in that mild stage. So the discussion of when and how to use this may be um, hampered by the bit that we do not diagnose Alzheimer's in the mild stage as often. There are trials running right now with several testing mechanisms to look at trying to find the protein or the gene that may cause Alzheimer's that would allow you to predict Alzheimer's disease. That in turn may change the way we use products like this. I think this is a groundbreaking product. I don't think it is the perfect product. I think it is leading us down a path to look at other products that will come after this that have similar actions do it better with less side effects. Cost here is about $56,000 a year. Many people would say that's incredibly expensive, not knowing if you're going to get a huge benefit from it. But for those that have um, family members or those in their life that have Alzheimer's disease, you know that $56,000 is a drop in the bucket compared to the care one needs when they have Alzheimer's disease and the cost associated with that care. Hulipta is a Japan. Um, this is the you know, the one migraine drug that blocks that CGRP, prevention of episodic migraines, 14 or fewer a month when people have that ongoing aspect that's out there. One thing about this one is it's prevention, not treatment. So this is not taken when you get the migraine. This is taken uh, every day to sort of keep things going. 10, 30, and 60 milligrams of this CGRP is where it goes. There's no guidance where to start or even titration. You can base the um, starting dose based on drug interactions and renal function and go from there. The advanced trial had almost a 1,000 folks in it. It did show a reduction in the number of migraine days, and you can see that listed with each dose that's there. And also, we saw statistically we saw a difference statistically between the doses. So, for example, 60 milligrams had a much greater impact on the number of days of migraines. It, it was much better, for example. Interactions are listed there for you. Be careful in CKD stage 4. 10 milligrams is the most you can use, and this is about $1,200 a month. So this is like Nurtec. Except Nurtec, I think, um, I think it is preventive as well. All the others in this category, though, are actually dealing with management of migraines when they occur. So they're the they're the ones that you use when you get a migraine. This is actually a prevention of migraines and used um, thinking ahead and using it daily, trying to re to reduce the occurrence of the migraine, not break the migraine when it does occur. Trudeza is a product that is dihydroergotamine reformulated into an intranasal spray. Now, you guys may, may have remembered this product from a long time ago. It is back. Acute treatment of migraine with or without aura. So this is to break the migraine overall. As I mentioned, it's a nasal spray. You can see that it's given in each nostril. May repeat in one hour for a total daily dose of four doses. So one spray at each nostril the first time around, then redose it within an hour same way. Max dose is six sprays over th seven days. So you get a week, three doses overall. Stop trial showed a 66% uh, report pain relief at two hours. 52% reported freedom from the most bothersome symptom at two hours. So we've always known that dihydroergotamine, dihydroergotamine works extremely well with breaking migraines. This is a reformulation into a nasal spray with some new technology that allows for absorption. It is $510 per dose, $510 per dose. So when you're looking at the daily doses, you're looking at the fact that um, you're looking at about 500 bucks for the first dose. And if you use it for the three doses, about $1,500 over those seven days. 
Oh, Labavi. I don't know what to do with this one, guys. Um, it's the addition of a new entity derived from naltrexone with an established antipsychotic. So we're adding a drug to olanzapine, and we're adding the drug to reduce the weight gain that's seen when one uses olanzapine. This is indicated for schizophrenia and bipolar 1. The dosing is listed there for you. Efficacy is exactly the same as olanzapine. It, it, it doesn't have a greater impact on schizophrenia or bipolar management. However, we know olanzapine has a significant amount of weight gain weight gain associated with it when we put it on board to help with these issues. So the impact showed that when you put this new product on that's derived from naltrexone, a 180-pound patient would gain 7 pounds at 6 weeks versus 12 pounds with olanzapine alone. Okay, great. So we've reduced the chance of weight gain using olanzapine. The question I have is, why use olanzapine if we could just use another product altogether that does not have this much weight gain associated with it? This also goes back to the talk on obesity. If you're looking at folks and they cannot get rid of weight, look at their medication list. Are they on products that actually promote weight gain, such as olanzapine? And are there other products that can be used? Some would say if they're stable in olanzapine doing extremely well, moving them to this product would be a good idea because it would reduce the chance of them gaining weight. And that could have that could have a great impact and truth when it comes to the way they're managing their weight. Also, it could have impact on glucose and lipids if you reduce that amount of weight gain associated with it. Side effects are actually identical to what we saw with olanzapine, but notice in the safety profile, it has a 19% incidence of weight gain, even though we've added this other product, 19%. So one in five are going to gain weight on this product. So I don't want you to walk away thinking, oh, well, with um, Labavi, if we do this for olanzapine, weight gain is just not going to be a problem. That's not true. If you add this, the weight gain will be less, but there will still be weight gain associated with it. Also, this is $1,700 a month. Once a lansapine by itself, this is a much, much more expensive product than a lansapine by itself, and actually a much more expensive product than some of the other antipsychotics that we have on the market that do not have weight gain associated. In dealing with this particular product, Kelbri is actually used as um, an SNRI much like Stratera for the treatment of ADHD. I included it because I wanted to make you out there and make sure you're aware of it. The dosing is listed there for you. We're seeing a lot of shortage these days in some of the products that, do, that deal with ADHD, including Adderall. So we're seeing people look for um, adjunct therapies, other types of therapies to put on to really work for those folks who cannot get to their stimulants. This particular product showed onset of action as early as one week with an impact both on the inattentive and hyperactive impulsive clusters that are associated with ADHD. However, it uses it takes several weeks to see this impact. Even though this trial said as early as one week, most people it takes several weeks, anywhere between two to five. You will see improvement in quality of life from this trial. Notice the dose down below, um, starting dose at $350 a month versus 110 with Stratera. I would say that Stratera probably remains the drug of choice here, although Quelbury is coming in as a secondary. You will see people start to look for this, and also you may see insurances um, using this as the preferred, preferred SNRI because of the jockeying that will happen behind the scenes between the insurance companies and uh, the um, maker, the manufacturer. So you may see the copay for this one cheaper, but cash pay folks, this drug is $350 a month, while Stratera terror remains at 110. Respiratory illnesses or respiratory management overall. I never thought I'd be talking about a vape product as a new product from the FDA. However, I wanted to include this because I was really amazed by the way they've changed looking at the way we manage smoking cessation. Smoking cessation in general is much like being addicted to anything else. The question is, are we going to manage it with Nicotine, lower doses over a long period of time, much like we do Suboxone for narcotic addiction or narcotic over, um, uh, use disorder. That's where this particular kind of product comes into play with the FDA. The FDA put a pathway in place called the PMTA, Pre-Market Tobacco Product Application. So when you look at this particular aspect, what they're looking at is they're saying if you put something on the market – in this pathway, will it reduce the amount of cigarette smoking that occurs in patients or in people? Will it change the way someone uses conventional cigarettes? This is a vape. Two inhalations twice a day must be primed four times before use. It showed that it reduced the amount of conventional cigarette use by someone when they use this vape in addition to cigarette smoking. So they reduced the consumption of cigarettes. It does have addiction. In terms of the fact that it has nicotine in it, so you're feeding those receptors like you do anything else. The thing is, 
you're controlling the nicotine where it comes from and the purity of the product where conventional cigarettes tend to have a lot of things inside them that um, add to not only the nicotine's danger, but also a lot of other carcinogens that the vape does not have. So the question is, the FDA is sort of moving this into a category to say, we approve you using this as a smoking reduction or conventional cigarette use reduction strategy overall. I will tell you that of all the things out there, the View Solo is the second popular brand among consumers. Uh, the Puff Bar is the most popular, and it comes in pink and lemonade and strawberry and all these flavors. The FDA has said if you would like to get uh, on the market using this pathway, your vape has to taste like nicotine. It cannot be flavored with any kind of flavors that would appeal to adolescents or anyone that's younger. So they're not going to have bubblegum flavored or strawberry flavored, all those kinds of things. To stay on the market, this product must show this reduction overall. Right now, you do not need a prescription to get to this. This is not why I put it here. I put it here to know that this is now an option to help people reduce the way they use conventional cigarettes, and it can be used in conjunction with other products, for example, bupropion. Uh, the cost is listed there for you. It's twelve dollars to get the device, and about six ninety nine for those cartridges that are the nicotine cartridges that do not have any flavoring to them. This is very, very cheap compared to a pack of cigarettes in this day and age. The question is, does it really reduce or not? And according to the clinical trials and what this particular manufacturer showed, is people did use less conventional cigarettes as they used the vape to sort of bridge that with their nicotine and making sure that they covered uh, those receptors. With regard to addiction. Tespire. This is the first human monoclonal antibody asthma treatment that deals with the TSLP. It involves airway inflammation, brand new way to look at things. If you had to think about it, Tespire is kind of breaking ground with this aspect of being a biosimilar, but we also have Zolar, Nucala, Dupixent. They all work differently, but they're all biosimilars or all work through some sort of mechanism when it comes to the immune system. This is another mechanism used to add on to those that have severe asthma and those greater than 12. It's 210 milligrams sub-Q every four weeks given by a healthcare professional. Primary endpoints did show that there was a reduction in exacerbations in those that have asthma over that 52 weeks or one year. They did show a decrease in ED visits and hospitalizations overall as well. This is another add-on for those severe asthma patients that are on the inhalers and maxed out when it comes to everything that we give those that have asthma. You would add something like this biosimilar to them to reduce exacerbations. Again, as we've talked about, Zolaire, Nucala, Dupixent, Singular, all those are other options that sort of fit in the broad discussion of biosimilars. This is the only one, though, that's a TSLP. It's about $2,300 a month for the pre-filled injections that we've talked about. A little bit of comparison, Zolar is about $1,500, Nucala is about $4,000, and Tupixin's about $3,000. So this is a, a little bit cheaper with regard to the price. It does have a different mechanism of action. I do not have head-to-head -head trials to show that this mech of action is superior to the others or even um, non-inferior at this point. Dermatology. Every year when I do this, I always kind of laugh a little bit because one year I had like, I bet you 10 slides on dermatology. The other years I have none. This year I have something that I think is interesting uh, because it's it takes something that you and I have known for years and puts it together into one product. The reason I find it so interesting is this is the first combination cream that has put this sort of tr this tretinol with this benzoyl peroxide, and you're saying, well, this is genius. Why would we have done this in the past? Well, the trinitoin couldn't be with the benzoyl peroxide because it would be degraded. They've actually found a way to do microencapsulation delivery systems, so it sort of separates the two products so the benzoyl peroxide does not break down the product that costs so much money in this. We know overall that benzoyl peroxide is the first line therapy for mild acne. We just know that. And usually you put that with a retinoid and it really helps out a great deal. When these are sort of the, the aspects when it comes to mild overall, so you're using two different products. This product puts it together in one packaging, topical treatment of acne, patients nine years of age and up, a thin layer to the affected area once daily, so pretty easy to use, right? The clinical trials did show a two-point reduction when it came to the scoring system regarding acne and the, infl and the inflammation associated with acne. Also, you see the percentages there that shows the increase in lesions overall. Like with anything when it deals with a retinoid, you're going to have skin edema, redness, itching, dryness. Look at the cost. $450 for the cream versus $7 for a generic uh, retinoid 
and thirteen dollars for benzoyl peroxide. Now, granted, I love the fact this is a combination product. I love the fact they found a way to microencapsulate this in this delivery system. But you can buy benzoyl peroxide over the counter for next to nothing, and of course, we can now buy OTC retinoids. So the cost here is substantial. The one thing you have to tell folks, however, is when you use these products independent of one another, there it needs to be a time where the benzoyl peroxide has to dry on the skin before you can add the retinoid. And because of that, it does delay skin care at night. This takes that away. More convenient certainly is there, but it's at a cost that's substantially higher per month than would it be if you just took those extra five minutes in between applications of the two products for those with acne. But then again, being a 16-year-old and trying to use this, maybe this one's a bit easier than the, uh, the two together. And certainly there's no data when you compare standardized over-the-counter products with this brand new product. I don't have anything in a clinical trial that showed this was uh, superior to using a retinoid and a benzoyl peroxide separately. Uh, so at this point in the game, I can't say that you're going to get better control of the acne with this particular product called Twinio. Cardiovascular. Well, with cardiovascular aspects, one of the things that came out in 2022 was the new statin guidelines on what to do with, I'm sorry, the new um, hyperlipidemia guidelines on what to do with non-statin products. Now, up until a point, we had Zedia, right? And then we had the PCSK9s, and then we looked at a couple other products that came on the market uh, that I talked about last year from Bimpoic Acid. This year, we actually have Leakvio. Leakvio is a new class of cholesterol lowering medications that deals with uh, the breakdown of the PCSK9 in a different mechanism than the injectable that we're familiar with that was approved about five to six years ago. This is an adjunct with statins overall. It's 284 milligrams sub-Q given and then repeated in three months and then every six months given by a healthcare provider. So this is not a pill that's taken daily. So if someone is on a high dose statin, for example, and cannot get to the goal LDL that's been um, outlined for them based on their ASCVD score or previous events, you can add this product that's dosed every six months sub Q by a healthcare provider at a visit. It did show the LDL reduction of 48 to 52 percent. So it did add on the reduction or gave more reduction, if you will, above what the statin gave you. So if the statin got you to 40 percent and you needed 30 percent more, adding this product would get you there. That's also true, though, if you added the bimpoic acid or even the Zedia. The Zedia's got about a 10 to 15 percent reduction associated with it. Uh, what all these non-statin products are trying to prove, though, is their cardiovascular impact. There's a trial pending on this one that does show that it could have cardiovascular data where it does reduce mortality and events. That would be lovely as you add it to a statin, which we already know does that. So these classes are battling it out to see who will become the non statin adjunct to add on board when someone cannot tolerate a statin at the dose we need it or have not reached goal at that current dose because it was a big reduction uh, based on their ASCVD score and their event history. There are site reactions associated with this. Cost is listed there for you at $6,500 a year versus $61 for the PSCK9 inhibitors, so very much in line. The mech of action is different, but the outcome is the same when it comes to these products compared to the PCSK9 inhibitors. This is, however, sub-Q given every six months, and the three Orion trials did show that it did help people get to goal overall when it came to their um, scoring system for ASCVD and their risk factors for LDL. Gastroenterology. Safety is listed there for you. You need to be cautious with the liver. Make sure you're looking at someone with regard to the LFTs routinely. And also contraindication, and this is important. While this did have impact, and I talked about using those that did fail other therapies, if they've had a recent MI, unstable angina, a stroke, their heart failure is not controlled, or any type of AV block, this drug is not for them. This drug is not for them. This drug does impact AV conduction. It reduces the heart rate. It increases QT, and it could have issues with regard to overall conduction when it comes to the heart. So while this may be a good product for some with regard to UC and filling out the therapies, it is not universally going to be a drug you go to without ruling out all the things I just talked about. So anyone that has a history of cardiovascular disease, unstable angina, they've had a stroke, heart failure, this is not their product because of the conduction issues this drug may have. This is reserved for refractory patients who do not do well, who do not have these indications or past medical history. Maintenance dose is about $9,000 per month. New drug out. 
expensive, yes. I think you would argue, though, that if people have failed all other therapies up to this point, 9000 a month does not surprise me overall. I know it sounds like a great deal of money, but again, first in class with the discussion that this is going to help those that are refractory to all the other products for UC. Pain management. This is becoming a dis- difficult topic to discuss because it seems like we have less and less products to use, in particular because of the opioid epidemic that we see that's out there. This particular product is something I want to bring up. Now, naloxone has been around for a long time, and people are very familiar with it. But I want to point out to you that this is actually a much higher dose naloxone at 5 milligrams versus traditional 0.4 to 2 milligrams. You're asking yourself, well, why, why the higher dose? Well, studies have shown that if someone is actually using higher doses of an opioid and they overdose, it could be substantial. So the 0.4 to 2 milligram may not may not come in and knock enough of the opioid off the receptors to save their life during an overdose. So we have to redose them, correct? Uh, and usually we do that in one to two minutes. So they may get another 0.4 or 2 milligrams from the naloxone that we have that we'll consider to be standard dosing. The 5 milligram dose can actually have a greater impact for those that have taken more narcotic than we anticipate, and also the redose may uh, have them stay uh, conscious for a longer period of time. There's no data for any of this. This is all theory that it should work. So I just want you to be aware this is out there. Uh, it does have a cost associated with it, about $150. The, the Others, though, are about 400 The generic pre-filled is 20 bucks. So just know that the generic pre-filled, the nasal spray that are coming from some of the products that are out there or some of the uh, um, organizations that are out there are cheaper than looking at this brand new product. But if someone's using, for example, higher doses of an illicit substance, this may actually uh, help with the overdose situation, the fact that you're dosing less and getting a good impact with regard to knocking the opioids off the receptors. Women's health. I want to talk about this particular birth control. This is the first one on the market with a brand new estrogen over a decade. This estrogen is plant-derived. It comes from a thing called NEST, Native Estrogen with Selective Action in Tissues. The thought being that since this is a plant-based estrogen, it would have less of a chance of causing any of the cancers associated with animal-based estrogen. Of course, there's no data that says that's out there. Uh, there's a lot of people that talk about this, and of course, this may pe- make People feel more comfortable taking an OCP with an estrogen that does come from a plant-based derivative. It's less effective in those with BMIs greater than 30. Same side effects as other combo OCPs. So nothing new here with regard to how it's used, those kinds of things. It's just the fact that it's derived from a plant. Uh, Cost is $200 versus Yasmin and 28 or Yaz, which is about $80. So keep in mind, this is considered a little bit low dose. It is plant derived. It's a bit different than the others that are out there, but it is $200 a month, which makes it cost prohibitive compared to many of the other OCPs. Biologics. Last question. What is the difference between a biosimilar product and an interchangeable biosimilar product? There are your options, A, B, C, and D. We've talked about this already with an insulin. I'm stressing this because as pharmacists, I think we need to know how drugs are interchanged when it comes to biosimilars. It is vastly different than generics. So let you guys key in your answers there. All right. It's important to note here that we talk about what's going on with biosimilars, that that interchangeability has to happen if they have the same clinical outcomes overall. So biosimilars in general have expanded 
um, exponentially over the past 10 years. They continue to come on the market left and right. You and I both know the four the four letter extension at the very end is, is driving people crazy to know which one goes here and there. But that's really for the FDA try to get more products in the market and reducing the cost of them overall. I will tell you that when you talk about what we're dealing with here, the interchangeability is a big step because for a long time, we did not see any way to take the newer products. And when you receive the prescription, for example, a branded biosimilar, you couldn't just substitute one that cost you know 200 bucks less. Also, the indications didn't always match up between the original biosimilar and the next one that came out. With the interchangeability, this product-based aspect showed cl same clinical efficacy. That means it has to have the same indications. So the insulin I showed you, for example, that interchangeability with Simgly and Lantus now shows that. But that's diabetes, right? That's not the, that's not the most difficult part of biosimilars. Many biosimilars have anything from rheumatoid arthritis to psoriatic arthritis to ulcerative colitis. They can have all those indications, and the new product may not. Now, if it's interchangeable, they would have to show clinical efficacy or at least one of those indications for you to interchange it based on the diagnosis without having to call the prescriber to do that. An example of this is Celtizo. Celtizo is the first interchangeable monoclonal antibody for Humira. It's the second biosimilar on the market, however, but the first interchangeable. It has management of RA, psoriatic arthritis, Crohn's, UC, and you can see it with AS as well. Maintenance dose is listed there for you. You can now substitute this biosimilar for Humira, for those indications, for a cost, I hope, that's going to be less than $3,800. So just sort of keep in mind, this is out there, this is coming, and you're going to see more interchangeable uh, biosimilars that are going to be on the market soon. Hopefully not making life too difficult for you, but those four-letter suffixes are going to tell you if it's Celtizo versus the original Humira. So we've covered a lot. A lot. We've went through a lot of products, a lot of uh, ins and outs. So practice recommendations. Keep in mind, this changes dramatically. Even though I'm talking about products that were approved in 2021, and here we are in 2022 and 2023, these products may not even make it onto the shelves until a year after they've been approved. And even then, they may not be in good use because many people who write prescriptions are not going to jump on a brand new product. As I mentioned, several of these are first in class. Many of them are going to be like third and fourth line therapies are used in refractory patients. So even though we're talking about this now, it could be 12 18, 24 months before we actually use these products in any kind of numbers, or it may not even make it at all. They may not become popular at all. As pharmacists, this is designed to give you a heads up about what's out there, what's coming, and what we may see rise to the top with regard to new products. For example, the new cholesterol medication I talked about, you may see that one become prevalent with regard to reaching uh, LDL goal. So how do we stay current as pharmacists? Well, I use the prescriber's letter, pharmacist letter. I use the Lexicomp app, but I also go to FDA a great deal and pull up their website and see what's being approved and what's happening, especially if a new product comes out that I think is going to be groundbreaking. I keep a file all year long so I can make this particular presentation. I know not everyone's going to do that, but sort of keep in mind that you need to have a file out there that has newer products and where you may get a lot of questions and you're trying to learn about it. I hope this slideshow or PowerPoint puts that perspective for you, but also gives you a reference point when you're dealing with your patients and customers and you're able to answer questions and counsel based on these two products. Keep in mind, these are the changes in the market over the past year. The FDA approved 93 first-time generics versus 70 in 2020, and here are just some of the ones I thought were important. I do list Chantix here, but keep in mind Chantix is off the market currently because of the reformulation they're going through. But even looking at that, Zeljans, for example, went generic. I thought that was important to put in here for pharmacists.